Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be celebrating Older Americans Month with a discussion on organizations that support our elders with our special guests, Adrian Iverson, President and CEO of the Elder Care Alliance of the San Francisco Bay Area, Don Simonson, President and CEO of Trellis in Minnesota, and Mark Clark, President CEO of the Pima Council on Aging in Arizona. So thank you all for joining us. We're so happy to have you here to discuss just sort of the important topic that, it, that affects all of our families in fact, and, and affects all of us. So just sort of to set, to set this up, we're gonna to go to you, uh, Adrian, first. In uh, 2018, there were 52 million Americans over 65, about 30% of whom were economically insecure. Almost, almost a third of older Americans are economically insecure. And in 40 years, all those numbers are gonna double. We're gonna have a, a ton of people who are living in need and who have no ability to earn extra income. So let's talk about your work, how you support older Americans, and special, especially those of limited means. So Adrian, could you just sort of unpack what you do at the Elder Care Alliance? Sure, so we are a senior living organization. So we're predominantly assisted living and memory care uh, based here in California. And uh, as some people may know, it's predominantly private pay. And so when you talk about that um, economic insecurity, you know, we can serve, I always say about the top 10%. And so one of the things we're really thinking about is how we expand outside our walls to be able to serve a broader socioeconomic group. Um, one component of our business though is the Mercy Brown Bag Program, which has been in operation for about 30 years. And we feed um, right now about 8,000 low income seniors, two bags of nutritious groceries every month. And so certainly in the pandemic, we've seen that uh, jump exponentially. Um, but we see that growth of um, elder food insecurity and hunger um, to be a growing issue and in some senses a silent issue. Um, and I think it goes beyond food to also addressing the issues of loneliness and si social isolation, which is some of the things we try to do th through components of our program as well. And historically, the United States has really been um, behind the curve. When, it when we look at, uh, at elder care, partly because of how our society functions. Um, the Great Depression and then the, uh, the programs that came after uh, really shifted the curve in terms of elder poverty, which was just endemic in the United States and, and very strongly embedded. It's, it's ameliorated, but as we move forward in, in, uh, in our society, how large is the future looking problem, Mark, when you take a look at, at your constituents? Are you concerned that uh, the curve is, is bending in the wrong direction at this point? Or do you feel like we are headed in the, in the right direction and we just need to accelerate that process? Well, I mean, that's a great question, uh, Mark. And uh, certainly I think uh, many things are changing, not the least of which is uh, the impact of this that this pandemic uh, has had on older adults uh, here in Pima County and throughout our nation and the world. Um, I think there's no question that we need to look at things differently. Um, issues of economic insecurity certainly have been heightened for older adults. Um, we're seeing a, a major issue we're seeing here in Pima County is a, a significant decline in affordable housing um, significant increase in rents. Uh, we've seen just a very large uh, surge in investor acquisitions of um, lower cost housing uh, and rents then being increased. So we, we are very concerned about that. I know uh, as we've been talking with our state and our federal partners uh, and elected officials about issue, issues like that and the pandemic, they're now beginning to talk about uh, the fact that we need to be thinking about this now in a, a recovery mode um, and some of the federal stimulus money we're, we're going to be allowed to spend over a longer horizon than we had originally anticipated. And so we're hoping to be able to begin to build systems um, where we can address some of those issues. Um, and also, of course, dealing in the here in Pima County with the local governments as well. 
And Don, as you take a look at, at the picture in Minnesota, and Minnesota is, is simply a microcosm of the United States. Um, when we see um, uh, issues of elder poverty, they, they also intersect with other issues, uh, gender, race, orientation, marginalization, mental health. Um, uh, Adrian was talking about memory retention. So there are various uh, health issues. How do you see um, the, the uh, challenges that you face and the unevenness of the distribution of challenge in different communities uh, when it comes to the services that you provide in Minnesota? Thanks, Mark. We just completed here at our organization an access evaluation. So really trying to understand how indigenous and uh, elders of color have, have access to the, the basic services we fund, meals, transportation, chore, uh, et cetera. And as we were learning uh, uh, more deeply about the current status of older adults, it's very clear that lifelong disparities that affect Native elders and affect uh, uh, people of color just become that uh, they don't go away in elderhood. And when the complexities then of declining health, declining cognitive status, then intersect with these lifelong disparities that uh, that are um, are present for people, the their their the quality of life for older adults, the longevity of uh, older adults in BIPOC communities is just much reduced compared to the majority population. And so for an organization like ours, that's a funding organization as one of our roles, it, you know, it's our responsibility to say, how do we, uh, how do we target our funds to have a, a, a more equitable distribution of those funds, recognizing that people and organizations don't start in the same place. And disparities in Minnesota, across the lifespan, unfortunately, are very significant. You know, it's, it's so interesting. When these organizations started off years ago, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, the, the idea was that we were taking care of one problem set, and it was generic, right? People were getting older, they needed care. Now, it's, we, we become so much more sophisticated um, in terms of the individuals, and individual needs, and we've had to change the organizations that we've served. We now now cannot just hire people or create a board just because they have a skill set uh, in serving elders. There are also cultural appropriate uh, appropriately uh, services as a way of thinking, as a way of approaching. There's the idea of 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 uh, how different groups within our society function. Adrian, what kind of changes have you seen in the arc of your involvement in this sector um, to modernize the, uh, the uh, your organization? You know, I think one one piece I would highlight is is around our memory care program because I think there is such stigma associated with people with cognitive impairment, and so we set out to to look at what philosophies were out there um, that were kind of best in class, and we ended up partnering with the I'm Still Here. A group based out of Boston and Dr. John Zeisel. And really it's a shift in focus and a shift in philosophy to say every individual can learn, grow, and contribute no matter their cognitive status and ability. And that is a big shift. Um, and I think one of the things that we really saw um, clearly through the pandemic is um, systemic ageism, right, throughout and across our country. Um, and so I think addressing that in the the attitudes, the negative attitudes we have about um, age and aging and our own aging process, which by the way, um, have been shown from a um, evidence perspective to really impact our quality of life and longevity are big issues that we've got to address. So we saw that as a huge change in kind of our, our culture when we implemented that memory care philosophy. And one of the things we're really passionate about is how do we start to address some of the the issues around ageism, stigma, and associated with aging um, more broadly, not just within our organization. I love your reference to philosophy. Mark, I saw you nodding um, in terms of this idea of, of philosophy and our values, our culture of our organizations. Um, how, do, how does that manifest uh, in, in your environment? Because what, what Adrian's saying is not just the technical skill of providing a service, it's about how you think about people 
and how you think about condition, right? Sure. Well, absolutely. I mean, people uh, obviously are living longer. Uh, when the Older Americans Act was passed, I think uh, people were probably, uh, certainly when Social Security was passed, people were not even living to full retirement on average. And now people are living significantly longer. Um, I know, uh, you know, one of the questions is about people needing to work longer. Um, and um, that, that, I think, has actually been a, a, an interesting benefit. I've only worked in the aging space for about seven years, but my predecessor uh, worked into her mid-80s, uh, and um, as did the guy that was in between us. So our founder worked into um, her mid-80s. Um, so having an opportunity to be productive and, and move forward is so important. I can tell you one of the things that, that I've seen, uh, we've seen especially around the pandemic, not to harp on the pandemic, but uh, especially around the pandemic has been access to vaccines has really been completely technologically driven in our community. And I think that's true probably around the country. Um, and that's been a challenge. Um, and I've actually heard people in government say, well, you know, seniors, they just need to get with technology. Well, it, 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 it's not a, just a technological fluency issue. It's also a broadband access issue. You know, we hear about broadband access, but frankly, people tend to think of that, I think, in the, in the frame of um, younger children, you know, at school age children. It's, a, it's an issue across, uh, across the lifespan, I guess you might say, and it's an, e an economic issue. So, and then there's just the whole issue of who has, who can afford the technology. So trying to think about how we, do, how we deal just with that one specific small point of technology uh, and the attitudes that come with that, I think have really been heightened um, in the pandemic. And, and Mark? I would just say, Mark, that's such an important point because there's so much technology now that, that will enable people to age in place better and longer, right? And uh, at a much lower you know, price point, so to, speak, so to speak, or cost. And so I think that issue of broadband um, access and equality is such an important point if we want to really enable a, a broader socioeconomic group to age in place better longer. You know, we just completed a uh, a poll in which we said, "Do you have or uh, do you or have you cared for an older adult in your family?" And fifty percent said yes, and fifty percent said no. What what I find to be interesting is that it's going to end up being a hundred percent. This is a poll that at any point in time will have its own percentages. Maybe it's fifty percent but it will end up being 100% because we're all going to get older and eventually the person that we, we care for will at the very least be ourselves, right? So this is an inevitable problem. And if we have limited income, then having that income trickling through our fingers in terms of broad, uh, broadband connection costs on a monthly basis, there are sometimes some really difficult decisions to make. You might not have access to broadband because you need to spend your money elsewhere, right, Don? That's right. And I think one of the costs really that we need to continue to, to try to drive down for older adults are healthcare costs. So our, our gaps in Medicare are still very significant, including gaps in coverage for, for drugs, for new drugs, for basic drugs like insulin. So the out-of-pocket expense for older adults uh, for uncovered drugs or drugs that are partially covered or to pay for those Medicare supplements or Medicare Advantage plans uh, really uh, require quite a bit of uh, monthly income to go out the door for an older adult to maintain their, their health. And, uh, and I think that we know that if older adults can access preventive services, primary care, high quality, timely, acute care, that that not only is the, the right thing to do for older adults, but it also will help our overall um, spend on healthcare uh, because you know, I think we believe that we will have healthier older adults, fewer older adults that require uh, premature institutionalization, better quality of life. And so this, this need to continue to drive down healthcare costs for older adults is really critical. We're gonna launch a poll that is about exactly this topic about uh, uh, to what extent 
we are uh, we should be investing in care for older adults. It would be very interesting to see how people respond. Um, if you if you look at this healthcare cost issue, uh, so often uh, healthcare our healthcare system the costs of it are justified in terms of the development of new drugs, which benefit us, us all and certainly older older Americans. Do you believe in terms of your constituencies that, that the costs, the return on that cost investment, keeping drug prices high so that new innovations can be funded by private companies, is that worth the return on investment, which is the basically the question that you're begging, Don. Uh, let me give you the, the first cut at that, and then we'll go around to Mark and to Adrian. Is that worth the, is that worth the price of the high cost of drugs? I mean, I think we have to say that we want to be a leader in this country, right, in, in developing new treatments and drugs, uh, including to slow the onset of Alzheimer's and other dementias. But, but there are other reasons that drug costs are high, right? We, there, there should be no reason that an older adult that has a supplement to Medicare or an advantage plan to Medicare might pay $200 at a month at a certain pharmacy for the very same drugs that they, that they would pay $10 a month for at another pharmacy. So there are all these complexities in our, our, our system of, um, of distribution and availability of drugs and coverage and formularies that are often just unknown to the average consumer and they, they spend more money than they should. And for basic drugs like, like insulin or inhalers or um, other drugs that uh, have not been as expensive in the past and are so now, that doesn't equate for me relative to your question in terms of costs of investing in new drugs and new treatments. So what you're saying is that there are so many drugs where the innovation um, happened uh, decades and decades ago, and these are just basically generic uh, drugs at this point, it's it, the cost should be low, transparent distribution should be uh, pretty much automatic, accessibility should be general, um, and what you're saying is is that you could absolutely improve the situation considerably just by that act. Is that is, is, am I understanding that correctly? That that's correct, and I think that that would be a very consumer focused, consumer oriented. Um, uh, actions that would, um, I think, older adults would would appreciate. And I think the sad part of it is that many older adults right now just don't realize that they could, that there are some things that they could do to control their medical costs related to drugs, and they are just completely unaware of what that might be. Mark, how do you see it? Well, I think it's very similar. I mean, we do a lot of work talking with Medi Medicare beneficiaries in our system, as I've Pretty sure Don does as well, right. um, and you know, and we had a, we had a several, uh, uh, maybe two years ago, we had a woman come in, and she had a ten thousand dollars she was paying in Part D co-payments, the drug benefit and co-payments um, and premium costs uh, that somebody had sold her, a, an agent had sold her that policy. We sat down with her; she couldn't afford it. We sat down with her and actually ran her her drugs through the Medicare computer, which anybody could do on, on Medicare's website. Uh, and we found her a policy that was gonna cost her $2,500 a year in terms of, of premium costs and co-pays. So um, there, there just is, because of the way the system is structured, there are many opportunities for, uh, for costs to be incurred. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it, uh, I know I, I was for a while on a, uh, an old um, antibiotic that was a generic, but nobody, but only one company was producing it at that point in time. And so they tragically jacked up the prices. Uh, it had nothing to do with development. It had everything to do with a return on the owner of the company's um, you know, investment. And um, it, it isn't like I don't believe in, you know, the fact that people ought to be able to make money. And clearly, I think there's no question older adults want choice. Um, but there also is just a huge amount of demagoguing that's going on in the market related in, in the world related to healthcare costs and the churn um, and the expenses. 
This is in part um, a question of our own human values. It seems to me that, that there is a part of capitalism where we just feel like we should be able to uh, get whatever they, we can get. So the person who sold the $10,000 policy to uh, your older client, they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They, they made a sale, they made the most money they possibly can. But it, it, do we need to combine this idea of capitalism with this idea of taking care of, of each other? In other words, this idea of community. Uh, Adrian, um, you talked about the whole idea of helping people who might not uh, have all their facilities as they age. Um, and it seems that, that elders are very often exploited uh, for that fact. Do we, have to, do we have to shift how we think about this and then also create sanctions um, that specifically target people who are taking advantage of, of your clients who need help from us all? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to that underlying uh, topic that I spoke to earlier around ageism, right? And our own that our own personal perceptions of age and, and the aging process. Um, and do we value older adults and the contribution that they can make um, to, to our communities and society or not? Um, and I think we've got to have some explicit conversations about what our real um, beliefs are. Um, about older adults um, in the contributions. I think the other thing, I, the two other points I would make relative to the, to the drug issue is, I think one of the things that is so encouraging coming out of the pandemic is that there was unprecedented collaboration and gover government support, right, of the vaccine development. And you can see what that does in terms of speeding up um, that timeline. And so um, the other pieces, there's, there's um, at least one company that I know know of out there that's utilizing artificial intelligence um, to really uh, shorten the drug uh, design cycle or production cycle and um, get a get a higher hit rate right on those drugs that are that are effective. And so I think there's some things coming down that will help us reduce um, you know the cost to produce um, drugs. But I think the last thing I would say is if you look at the Netherlands, the per capita spend is pretty comparable to the US, except a much lower percentage of it um, is on healthcare. And we are very healthcare medical drug focused and not home and community-based services focused. And when I think about older adults, particularly older adults with cognitive impairment, you know, if I've got a disease, the medical system knows how to handle that. If I have dementia, there's not a lot of supports. And we've got to be thinking about how we shift dollars away from healthcare and the medical system and more to home and community-based services. Um, and there's a way to do it where you get better outcomes without, without the spend. It's, I would it's just say, go ahead. I would just say completely support Adrian's position. And I think there's good work happening across the country uh, where there are new models where healthcare organizations and aging services, social services organizations are addressing both the healthcare and the, the social needs of, of older adults in ways that do uh, result in better outcomes. Uh, but the revenues have to follow so that the, the services delivered by the nonprofit social service community, um, those services must be paid for in full. It's such an important point. What you're basically saying is that the elder care system's revenue model is one that generates revenue so that it can flow to drug companies and medical uh, care providers, right? That's the revenue flow, right? And what you're saying is that actually too much of that flow is flowing into the hands of private interests that are attached to the medical community and medical care and drugs, and not enough is flowing into the social, psychological, and well-being needs of older Americans in this country. It's a very interesting point, right? It's the intersection of commercial interests and our caring um, uh, uh, workflows. And maybe our, our caring workflows should, should be adjusted uh, to provide a more balanced uh, uh, provision of care for older Americans. 
Uh, Mark, um, uh, we just completed a poll in which we first asked whether Social Security should be retained um, in order to, to uh, help um, elder, elder Americans. 100% people said yes. So that's no surprise. We're, we're doing a poll right now, which is really focused on um, where people see the largest problems that uh, people confront. We're going to go around the, the table one more time because we're coming to the end of our time. Um, and let's talk about, Mark, what you think the biggest, most impactful act we could take to improve the lives of your constituents on a national and local level. What would that be? Well, I think um, it sort of builds on the conversation we were just having, and that's this uh, concept of social determinants of health, um, which we know have a huge, much larger impact on people's uh, longevity and, and health than does spending on medical care. And that's food security, employment, income, housing, uh, behavioral health, um, all of those issues. And so uh, one of the challenges, uh, which I think Don was alluding to, is that the, that the healthcare system has been very slow to come to the realization that if they, in fact, support those kinds of services um, or the justice issues attached to them, that they'll be spending less money on caring for people with significant chronic health conditions. And so trying to do that, that's number one. And then number two is the workforce issue, especially the direct care workforce issue is a huge issue for us. And Don, what do you, what do you see as the, uh, as the major change that ought to take place? I would, I would build on what Mark said, and it, it's not only the private healthcare system, but it's also our Medicare program, right, needing to be certain that Medicare resources can be spent on social services. So I would, I would add that. And, and uh, Adrian, um, we'll give you the last word. What do you, if, if you could uh, wave a magic wand and, and get Congress to all hold hands and, and sing songs together, what would you like them to do? Uh, well, there'd probably be two, two things on my wish list. And one is similar to what Don um, service, which is a reimbursement model that would actually focus on maybe an evidence-based well-being measure as opposed to services. Uh, or a health healthcare outcome. And the second is, is something Mark um, surfaced, which is um, if you look at unpaid caregiving hours, um, I think it was like 18.4 billion uh, associated with people living with dementia. And I think about our team members uh, who they themselves go home at night and are caring for uh, one of their parents. And so there's got to be a recognition for the family caregiver and how do we have supports for them? Um, and so that would be the other, other piece that I would want to tackle. And our attendees uh, voted as well. Uh, they voted for uh, two, two issues. One is the healthcare system is difficult to access, difficult to navigate, lacks transparency, expensive, is ineff inefficient. That needs to be simplified uh, according to our attendees. And the other uh, piece is the lack of available in-home supportive care. In other words, it's the very much the human non-medical piece, the social interaction piece. So, they, so our attendees seem to echo the, the kinds of, of uh, input that you're providing. I'd like to thank you all for sharing your experiences and for your wonderful work, the work of your boards, your staff. You're so important and when we think about the fact that we have a huge, huge part of America that uh, lives in insecurity and need, and the work that you're doing is so very important. Uh, thank you for sharing your, your work with us, and thank you very much for your insights. <music>